good morning. Hello, welcome. My name is Jackie Anderson and I'm an assistant dean at the University of St. Thomas and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our weekly online learning session, The Past, Present, and Future of Global Supply Chain with Professor Kyle Goldschmidt. We're so glad you're joining us today. Uh, looking ahead, mark your calendar. Uh, next week, on Thursday, May 28th, we have the benefits of contemplative and mindfulness practice with Dr. Karen Kozen Lean. She's adjunct faculty here at St. Thomas, and her teaching and consulting has focused primarily on conflict and positive interventions. It should be a great session. Well, I certainly hope you've been enjoying this weekly professional development we've been offering. Um, if you're interested in more comprehensive development, I'd encourage you to visit our website. We have flipped all of our courses, so they will be virtual, likely through the remainder of the year. Um, what's different though with our courses uh, that are more comprehensive is we do cap attendance to about 25 folks. So if you're interested in participating, you will have the same personalized attention that you're used to when you attend a University of St. Thomas course. I hope we, we see you in one of our courses in the near future. So with that, our plan for today is like it is every week. In a moment, I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kyle Goldschmidt, and he's gonna spend about 40 to 50 minutes on the topic of the past, present, and future of the global supply chain. Now, he wants us to be interactive if possible, so as your questions arise, feel free to put them in the chat feature um, addressed to all panelists, and we will try to get as many questions as we can uh, answered throughout the course of the presentation. Um, also know that the presentation is being recorded and it is our promise to you that we will get it out within two to three business days following today's session. So with that, it is my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Professor Kyle Goldschmidt. Uh, Kyle is a professor in the Department of Operations and Supply Chain Management here at the University of St. Thomas. And the focus of his research has been on the impact of Supply Chain Disruptions on Managerial Decision-Making, really published. Um, prior to joining academia, Kyle worked at the Ford Motor Company, where he designed steering system components and worked with crash safety system. Uh, he has an MBA and a PhD in Supply Chain and Information Systems from Penn State. I can promise you a great dialogue today and presentation with Professor Kyle Goldschmidt. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, before I get started on the presentation, uh, two days from now, uh, our senior class at the University of St. Thomas, our class of 2020, will be graduating. So I wanted to send out a heartfelt congratulations to our seniors and wish you all the best in the future. Now, what seems like uh, forever ago, uh, I was graduating my, uh, my undergraduate and I went to go work for Ford Motor Company. And within three months of starting at Ford, uh, I had, was working on a project that essentially stopped production at one of the largest facilities, uh, manufacturing facilities that they operate. And at the time I didn't realize the enormity of the situation. And it wasn't until a few years later that I actually started working in a manufacturing facility that I started to understand the complexity of bringing thousands of parts together to produce the, um, the products that we use every single day. This is where my interest in supply chain started. And it's also where I first realized about um, how supply chain disruptions can impact an organization. So uh, as Jackie mentioned, uh, I was in charge of, uh, well, in the production facility, I was actually in charge of brakes uh, and steering. And these two components tend to be uh, pretty critical. And so uh, a lot of uh, disruptions were caused by me uh, within the manufacturing facility. And so I got the nickname, um, haven't shared with this, this with many people, but I got the nickname Stop Ship Goldschmidt. Uh, but I really got interested in these supply chain disruptions and I decided to go back and start studying them. So I've been studying uh, supply chain disruptions for years now and it's my honor and my privilege to share my experience and my knowledge with you. 
So, move to the presentation. So today I'm gonna to talk about the past, present, and future of supply chains. And before I get into the presentation, what I would like to do is talk about uh, a lot of media attention that the supply chains have garnered. And so to share a few uh, quotes from the media, from the rising cost of raw materials to extensive disruptions, companies face a range of risks in what is becoming an increasingly complex world of supply. Companies around the world are scrambling to retool their supply chains, and many are finding that they might not be as well prepared as they thought. And last, this event is causing many companies to rethink their global supply chain strategies, which suddenly seemed extremely fragile. Now, you might think that these are quotes that have come out in the past few months, but unfortunately, these are from 2011, right? And these are all from the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. And so the question is, if so many companies and there was so much media attention around rethinking the supply chain, why hasn't anything changed? Well, I'm gonna to get to that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but before I answer that, I'd like to talk about the past, present, and future of supply chains. So today I'm gonna to talk about how did we get into uh, the situation that we're in, the COVID-19's impact on supply chains today, and how we can start to rethink the future of the supply chain. So to start off, let's talk about the past and how we got here. So many of you joining me today are likely uh, supply chain managers, but for those of you unfamiliar with the supply chain, supply chain is essentially how we get products from raw material stage, like you see all the way here at the left-hand side of the screen, through the suppliers that build the various components, the manufacturers that assemble the fin final products, the distributors and warehouses that ship to these stores, the retailers that sell the products, and finally the consumer, you and I, or uh, in many other cases, other businesses. So interconnecting these various stages or nodes is logistics. So there's lots of uh, either shipping or air transportation, um, also uh, vehicles that connect these various nodes within the supply chain network. Now, we talk about supply chain, but it really is a network. And these are really complicated systems that, uh, you know, that tend to be equated to something as complex as biological systems. So for example, many of us today are watching this presentation on a laptop. And how did our laptop get here? Well, the various components, uh, the raw materials, they come from around the world. Right? So many of us don't think about where the products uh, that we use every single day come from and how they end up with us, the consumers. But that is the supply chain. The supply chain is what makes uh, our products possible. And so the supply chains really started to change starting in the 1970s. And at this point, uh, there was a real change in uh, the globalization and the global economy. So we see the rise of China. We see America trying to compete on cost as opposed to uh, quality. And with the expansion of global logistics and improved information technology, this is what allowed the growth of globalization and our global economy. So this has achieved many things. So most of them good. Uh, the products that you and I use every single day, we can afford them at, uh, we can purchase them at lower costs. It also has led to improved profitability for companies being able to lower the cost of their products. But with this exportation of production throughout the world, it has also, um, we've seen a loss of uh, production and manufacturing in the United States, uh, leading to loss of jobs, and also the knowledge of how to produce some of these products. Now, with this, 
globalization is also increased the complexity of the supply chain greatly. And this increased complexity has really led to um, uh, uh, increase in risk of disruption. And we're experiencing a lot of this now. We're realizing what decades of uh, uh, focus on uh, just-in-time operations and reducing costs has had this effect of really tightening inventories, uh, reducing inventories to the point where when there is a disruption, uh, it is impacting the entire supply chain. So that is what we are seeing today, is these disruptions that are an artifact of the supply chain uh, that we create, that organizations have created over the past 40 years. So I want to spend the bulk of the presentation on the present and talk about how companies are being impacted and the impact on their supply chain. So in the April 2020 Thomas report, uh, COVID-19's impact on North American manufacturing, uh, a survey went out to manufacturers to identify how COVID-19 is impacting the businesses. And you can see there's a whole list here. Today I want to uh, talk about and focus on the top four. So specifically demand, cash flow, supply, and logistics. So I'm going to start off speaking and talking about uh, demand. So from the same report, a number of manufacturers across all industries reported that they're seeing a change in demand for their products or services. Right? So if you take a look, the blue is uh, the blue column, that's an increase in demand. The pink column is a decrease in demand. And if you sum those up, that's across all industries, we're seeing over 75% of companies having some change in demand because as a result of COVID-19. So this has a lot of implications for how businesses operate. Many of, many of you that work in supply chain know how hard it is to interpret the demand signal, right? So this is when we observe the changes in demand, a lot of our modeling techniques for forecasting what demand is going to be in the future are going to be severely impacted by any large or drastic changes in demand. Now, this can lead to other artifacts and other uh, behavioral considerations such as the rationing game, right? So, if, there, if demand outpaces supply, then companies might implement some form of rationing, right? So um, if, there, if demand is really great for, um, for a specific product and they can only supply so much of it, they'll only ship out what they can and try to, uh, try to provide their customers uh, equally in some way, distributed among their customers in so, some way. So the fact then is that the customers might then try to game this, right? And order more so that they get a greater portion, right? So this behavior leads to um, what's referred to as the bullwhip effect, right? So we see these signals as they go back up the supply chain from the customer to the retailer, to the wholesaler, to the manufacturer, to the supplier, we see this increasing signal of what is needed, right? And this makes it really challenging, no matter what stage of the supply chain you're in, to really identify what the true demand is and what the future demand is gonna be. So let's take a look at an example, and that's toilet paper. Right? So toilet paper demand hasn't changed much, but it has. So customers are purchasing more toilet paper today. We don't see toilet paper being used as much in, the, uh, in businesses, and that consumption has shift to our homes. And so this has sent a, um, uh, a signal that there is a change in demand for toilet paper. 
And so when you think about this, if uh, you know, the customers are buying more toilet paper, we see the empty shelves in the retailers. Retailers are then going to order more from, their, uh, from the manufacturers. The manufacturers of toilet paper then have to go and procure more raw materials. And when it comes to toilet paper, the toilet paper that we use at home is much different to the toilet paper that we use at work. And right? so the toilet paper that we use at home, it's soft because this comes from, uh, from uh, pulp, right? so from uh, paper pulp. And whereas the toilet paper that we use at work, that typically is made from uh, recycled material. Right? So this change, we're talking a change multiple steps up the supply chain. And in order to get the right product to the retailers, then to the customers, this is, it takes time and it's going, we, we see this today with toilet paper. Our, our shelves are still pretty empty when it comes to toilet paper. Now, you can consider the shift again as businesses start to open, right? So this is a real challenge for companies to try to identify you know, what is the true demand? How much should they be producing so that they have the right product at the right place at the right time? And so this is especially true as you move up the supply chain. So as you continue to move up the supply chain, the signal tends to be amplified and it makes it much harder to interpret the true demand. So the next challenge that I want to talk about is cash flow. And this is what I deem to be one of the most critical uh, uh, aspects of the supply chain that we need to be paying attention to. So the chart that I am showing here, uh, this shows small and medium sized businesses, their cash flow uh, in China. Now, this is Chinese data, but I don't expect US uh, small and medium sized businesses to be much different. And so what we see is that the vast majority of these small and medium sized businesses have anywhere between one month to three to six months of cash on hand. And so this is a real risk, especially as um, we continue to see these disruptions, it's going to put a lot of strain and financial strain on the suppliers that feed the manufacturers. So, these, the OEMs, the large uh, multinational organizations, it's, they rely on these small and medium sized firms to produce products. And so they, you, these organizations need to pay attention to the financial health of their supply chain and not just tier one. So tier one is the immediate suppliers to any company, but they need to be looking multiple tiers back into the supply chain. Now, this is typically very difficult. So there's uh, supply chain visibility is typically a large challenge. So a previous uh, Deloitte uh, survey found that about two thirds of supply chain or procurement managers don't see beyond tier one in their supply chain. We need to start looking further. Right? It's, it's imperative because for these organizations, their, their survival might rely on these smaller organizations. So when we look at how companies break out their spend, so typically we teach the ABC of procurement, right? So with this, 80% of spend is typically allocated to about 20% of the company's uh, that organizations have a relation with. These are the large spend suppliers. Now, I have a reference at the bottom here to an HBR uh, Harvard Business Review article that just came out uh, by Tom Linton. And these three points that I have here come directly from that article. And it's a wonderful article. I, if, if, uh, if you are interested, I highly recommend that you read it. But for those large uh, purchase suppliers. What companies now can be doing is placing orders in advance, right? Helping those companies 
getting the cash to those companies to ensure that they have enough cash on hand. Then at the other extreme is what's the, uh, identified as our C suppliers. So this is a small amount of spend, but spread out over a large amount of suppliers. So for these suppliers, you know, be in contact with them, help them, work with them, um, also maybe uh, provide them some financial assistance, but they, those suppliers might also need assistance finding the raw materials and procuring the raw materials that they need to make, uh, to make those products. And then in the middle, we have our medium-sized firms. And again, with these firms, it's imperative that communicate with these organizations, understand their financial health, and identify what is necessary to keep them running and operating. So you hear me repeating communicate. This is going to be critical for businesses in the coming weeks and months. You need to be communicating with your supply chain. You need to identify any, any potential risk in the supply chain and also come up with a plan of action, right? So prioritize the organizations that are critical to you. So when I was at Ford, um, the, the largest supplier to Ford at the time was Vistion, and they were facing bankruptcy. Ford infused, uh, I believe it was $1.7 billion into Vistion because if Vistion went bankrupt, Ford could not produce any product, right? So this is critical. Now, it's not always the largest supplier. Right? So uh, back in 1997, uh, Toyota faced a supply disruption that essentially shut down every single uh, production plant that Toyota owns and operates. And this was because their supplier, uh, ASEAN, they had to fire their production facility of a, um, of a brake valve. Right? And that one valve went into every single vehicle that Toyota manufactured. So, it's not just the big spend, pay attention to the little spend too, because these disruptions could come from anywhere. So I talked about uh, Ford investing in Visteon uh, back 15 years ago. Uh, today we see many large organizations investing and uh, infusing their supply chain with capital. So uh, back in April, Lockheed Martin issued $450 million in expedited payments. Right? They wanted to make sure that their supply chain was healthy. Just last week, they provided an additional 300 million to suppliers that were uh, severely hit by the economic slowdown. Right? So this is an example of you know, Lockheed Martin infusing their supply chain because the health of Lockheed Martin depends upon it. Now, I've given a lot of examples of you know, large organizations providing assistance uh, to small and medium businesses. But for anyone out there that is a small and medium business, be in communication with your, um, with your customers, right? Communicate with them, let them know your financial health, let them know if you need assistance. That is, you know, the communication is going to be uh, critical to the survival of the supply chain. Third, and this is also a critical component to the survival of the supply chain, is the supply of materials. Now, the chart that I'm showing here, this comes from uh, Resolink, and this is a supply chain monitoring service, and they've been doing a series of presentations um, about the, uh, the impact of the pandemic on the supply chain as well. And this is one of the charts that I found really interesting. So, they monitor um, the supply chain. And you can see that on the y-axis here, they're looking at the total number of uh, weeks delayed for the supply chain. And so there, and this is cumulative across all suppliers. And so we, we see two spikes. So the first is the, um, the shutdown in South Korea. And the second 
is essentially the global shutdown um, that as a result of COVID-19. So we saw many nations close their borders, uh, put in uh, restrictions on transportation, on movement, and this severely impacted the supply of materials around the world. Now, what I, what I expect moving forward is not these huge waves of disruptions, but a lot of small ripples, right? So these major waves are going to be replaced with little ripples of disruptions throughout the supply chain. So for example, on Monday, uh, Ford opened up uh, their operations across the nation. On Tuesday, two of those plants had to be shut down. And one of those was a plant that uh, I used to work at, Chicago Assembly. Now, these shutdowns were caused uh, by two reasons. So number one, a case of COVID uh, at the assembly plant. But the Chicago Assembly plant was shut down because they didn't have enough supply. Right? So uh, it, there was a lack of supply from Lear, who provides the seats for those vehicles. And so because there was no supply of seats, Ford couldn't build any vehicles. So we're going to see this uh, stop and go of the supply chain network as we continue to um, uh, feel the impact of COVID-19. This is going to be a challenge and we really need to try to um, be agile, be flexible, um, and I'll talk more about things that we can do to help hopefully manage and deal with these uh, ripples of disruptions. So first thing is monitor the countries and areas and locations that are impacted and exposed. So when, uh, when Singapore, who at first dealt with COVID-19 very well, they had a later outbreak. Right? a second wave of outbreaks that shut the, the country down. And that led to a number of disruptions throughout the supply chain um, in, that uh, involved Singapore. Now, developing a contingency plan. This might seem a little late, but there needs to be a plan. Have a plan of action. Have some idea of how these disruptions uh, of material, how your business can continue to operate. One of the main things that I highly recommend doing right now is invest in inventory, right? So with the Ford example, you know, Ford can't get seats. If they had an inventory buffer of seats, they could have been up and running and operating the Chicago assembly plant. Now, inventory is expensive, right? So, and you need to store it somewhere. So um, this is going to be expensive for companies. And I predict that there's going to be a, short of, uh, a, a shortage of warehouse capacity, right? So think about this and think about how you can um, make sure that you have enough material to continue your operations. The last item is looking for alternative sources. So if possible, identify some alternative sources for your materials. Now, this might be very difficult because it takes time to validate and, uh, and prove out a supplier, but for some products, that might not be the case. So um, try to identify any uh, products that, uh, or inputs that you have that could have alternative sources. Now I'm gonna use the COVID-19 testing kits as an example of how the materials, how the lack of materials can lead to disruption. So there is a known lack of testing kits throughout the world, right? But specifically here in the United States. And so there's three steps to, uh, to performing a COVID-19 test. Um, step one requires a swab, a tube, and the preservative solution within the tube, right? So as soon as you collect the uh, sample, this goes to a lab where they extract the uh, genetic material um, and look for the signal 
uh, of COVID-19 using a chemical reagent. Now, if there's a positive test, that the machine will identify this and, and identify you as positive or negative for COVID-19. Now, critical to this whole process, it's the swab, the tube, and the solution, right? And so when it comes to the swabs, this might look like a glorified Q-tip, uh, but in fact, these swabs are made by, only made by essentially two suppliers, uh, one being uh, in Maine called Puritan Medical Products, and the other being in Italy. And as COVID-19 spread around the world, these two companies were overwhelmed. We had no inventory of backup swabs. And so because this one component, the swab, is missing from the process, we have a lack of available testing kits. And we can see it's taking time to get the raw material, the, the product that we need, the components that we need to actually perform these tests. The last item I wanna talk about is the impact on logistics. So we have seen transportation around the world come to um, almost a standstill, right? So uh, I happen to live underneath the flight path for uh, Minneapolis Airport, and I can tell you there are many fewer flights. So there have been canceled flights. Now the airplanes, the commercial airplanes that you and I typically fly on, they also carry cargo. And so these canceled flights have an impact on the supply chain. So there's much less cargo capacity when it comes to air freight. There's also an increase in time sensitive demand. So there, we're trying to procure as much PPE in this country as possible. And a lot of that increase in time sensitive demand has further strained the air freight, right? So we have less capacity and at, uh, for certain items, more demand, which doesn't work out and has led to uh, a number of challenges with procuring uh, air freight. Second is our container ships. And this is how the bulk of the material that we use travels uh, around the world. And we have seen an increase in what's referred to as blank sailings. And this is when a uh, scheduled ship does not depart. Um, and much of this is due to uh, either a lack of uh, containers for the ship, so it doesn't make financial sh uh, sense for the shipping company to, uh, to sail as a result of the decrease in global exports. So this is something that organizations really need to pay attention to because of the lead time associated with ocean freight. Um, you know, another few weeks of delays can really pose a challenge for the supply chain. The last item is our road freight network. And so we, we have seen an increase in e-commerce, right? So we've seen the FedEx and the UPS and the Postal Service remaining busier, busier than normal. But this really hasn't made up, made up for the reduction in non-essential goods and specifically in industrial activity. So, um, you know, we've seen a real drop in our uh, truck volume in the logistics network across the United States. And hopefully this will recover uh, as we start to come back online. But there are many challenges associated with this. A silver lining though is that you know, with the, um, with the slowdown, our fuel prices have been pretty low, right? So that, that hasn't uh, put a lot of strain on the operational costs uh, for these logistics companies. And uh, so there are some benefits, but many challenges still remain. So this chart comes from uh, Statista and we are um, looking here at the pre-COVID forecast for growth uh, in the logistics industry in 2020. So 
It's estimated in North America about 2% growth pre-COVID-19. Now, that has dropped to essentially zero growth, and a pessimistic forecast looks at up to, sees up to a 15% decline in logistics. So this is going to pose a challenge for the companies that rely on, these, on the logistics network to operate. So what can companies do? Right? So start performing a capacity gap analysis. Right? What can your logistics providers provide and what are your needs? Be in communication. Right? So again, communication is critical here. So communicate with the carriers, understand what their challenges are and understand you know, when uh, they will be operating um, because you need, you need to have the knowledge of the timing of the logistics network. Start evaluating mode shifting, right? So mode shifting is moving from one logistics method to another, and it might be uh, that you might have to shift from utilizing a cargo ship to moving to um, you know, either air or rail or truck freight. Last is stay up to date with regulation. You know, we see a lot of regulations at the local, state, federal, and international level with closures of port, what industries are, uh, are deemed essential, right? So for example, as, as the U.S. tries to get manufacturing online, Mexico did not deem manufacturing an essential business. And so that is going to pose challenges along with challenges at the border with getting the goods and material into the country. So I also wanted to use an example of mode shifting. Um, and with the slowdown of air transportation, there, was, there were real challenges with getting uh, PPE to the US. And the majority of PPE, so 50% of personal protective equipment, is manufactured in China. And we needed to get those goods to the US. And, you know, using ocean freight, does, that isn't going to work. It takes too long. So what a number of companies and states and uh, uh, organizations did is they took these empty airliners and they... Um, they hired them to go to China and bring the PPE back here to the U.S. So what you see in the picture here is boxes of PPE strapped to the seats of a commercial airline. Additionally, so Boeing used their Dreamlifter. This is their specialized aircraft used to transport the components of their dream, uh, Dreamliner. So they used the Dreamlifter to transport 1.5 million medical grade face masks from China to South Carolina. So, you know, you're going to have to look and think about how the transportation network is operating and understand the challenges that you might face uh, due to the shutdowns uh, and, de and decline in demand for lo uh, logistics. All right, so I've talked a lot about the current state of the supply chain. What I want to do is close out with how we can start rethinking about the supply chain of the future. And so we need to focus on a more sustainable approach to supply chain management. Now, I say sustainable, and sustainable means balancing cost efficiencies with the associated risks. Right? And in order to um, balance these costs, you first need to identify and assess the risks. So after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in uh, Japan, uh, Professor Sim, uh, Simki Levy out of MIT, he worked with auto manufacturers to understand uh, how these disruptions impact the supply chain and perform these stress tests of the supply chain. So if a component weren't able to make it, what impact 
would that have on the business? And there were two specific measures that he came up with. So the time to recover and the time to survive. Right? So we need to start thinking about how these disruptions are going to impact the business and how long it's going to take the business to recover from these disruptions. We need to prioritize risk. Right? So what are the key businesses? What are the critical components to the operations of your business that if there were a disruption are going to be critical, right? So prioritize the risk when developing your business continuity plans. Next, improve supply chain visibility. So I had mentioned that the majority of organizations, companies don't see past one supplier up in their supply chain. This is going to have to change. And this is a real challenge. So companies that have uh, worked on this in the past have realized it's very difficult and it's very uh, cost intensive to develop the technology um, to really have the visibility insights. And so there are a number of companies that uh, are starting to come online to provide this service. And I believe that these companies, there's gonna be huge growth in these uh, technology to map uh, the supply chain, to identify risks within the supply chain because companies are now going to realize the, how valuable that information is. The fourth item is risk mitigation, right? So companies should start evaluating their sourcing strategies. They need to evaluate their inventory policies. Much of the time, the, the sourcing strategy and inventory policies have been focused on cost. That needs to be balanced with attention to risk as well. So companies need to move from this pure cost-driven supply chain to a more agile supply chain that can respond to these disruptions. And to do so, they're going to have to leverage technology and innovation. So blockchain, 3D printing, fintech, uh, these uh, supply chain risk mapping services, there are a number of technologies that either have been available and haven't been leveraged enough. Uh, and also a lot of innovation is going to come out of the, these supply chain disruptions. And, the, co the result of COVID-19 moving future. So pay attention to you know, the innovation that comes out, look at the technology that's currently available, and this is how we're going to uh, manage disruptions such as this in the future. Now, I'm gonna close with the fact that supply chains have gotten a lot of attention in 2020. Right? more so than anything else. And having studied supply chains, this isn't new. So I started off the presentation referring to the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan and the impact that that had on supply chains. But if we've seen this before, why are we experiencing such severe disruptions again? And my answer to that is cost has been the primary driver of how supply chains operate for too long. My research into behavioral operations has shown that supply chain and procurement managers, they will focus on cost because this is what's reinforced and this is how procurement managers tend to be incentivized. So that continuous reinforcement of cost with, from throughout the supply chain, this has been the primary focus. When we do experience a disruption, yes, some companies will react. We see a lot of attention to the supply chain and my research has shown that you know, the pain that we're feeling, feeling now, there will be a reaction, there will be a change, but this tends to be short-lived because there's a lack of reinforcement about the value of risk mitigation. So moving forward, 
we need to remember the lessons that we've learned from this experience. We need to rethink the supply chains and rethink how we reinforce the fact that these disruptions can happen. And while they don't happen every day, every week, every month, every period, every year, they can still happen. And the impact that they can have can be very severe. And we need to take that into consideration when making strategic decisions about the supply chain. So I will do a last bit of self-promotion. Um, so I, Jackie had meant that, uh, mentioned that I do research in this area. I do have a forthcoming article in the Manufacturing Service and Operations Management Journal. Um, and while it's not published and available yet, uh, a copy is available on SSRN. Uh, so you can either contact me and I can send you the link or um, I believe it's also linked through Google Scholar. With that, I'd like to thank you for joining me this morning. All right, um, Kyle, thank you so much. Um, I have uh, questions in the chat. If you're game to answer a few, let me, uh, let me send some your way. Of course. <clears throat> All right. Uh, how likely is it that companies bring manufacturing, production, and sourcing back to North America? So there's been a lot of talk about reshoring. And I do think that it's going to happen. I saw a recent survey that two-thirds of companies are considering reshoring. Um, the challenge is going to be that when you move manufacturing overseas, there's, there's a lot of information and knowledge that goes along with that manufacturing. So it's, I don't think it's just going to be a sudden movement back. Um, I think that it's going to take time and it's going to be in conjunction with technology and other factors. I see nearshoring as an, uh, a more, uh, as a, more prolific short-term approach. So nearshoring is bringing manufacturing closer. So whether it be to low-cost manufacturing in Mexico um, or other low-cost regions, um, nearshoring, it's gonna be a little bit easier because there's not going to be as, mu as many obstacles uh, as uh, I believe as reshoring. And this, can, this question is directly connected to this, and you can probably put an exclamation point on it. Do you anticipate a permanent return to stateside um, job shopping for manufactured components such as stampings, machining, molds, SMT, et cetera? It's hard to say. Um, my, my research has shown that you know, cost has always been a primary driver. So if we can bring these ma this manufacturing back and compete on cost, then yes, that is a sustainable long-term approach. But I believe that the only way that we're going to get there is having technology to support that manufacturing at a lower cost. All right. Thank you. Um, another question. With regard to sourcing strategies, what options do companies have? What are the trade-offs? So, for a long, for uh, I'll break this into two parts. So, a uh, short-term strategy is to invest in inventory, right? So, uh, investing in inventory, you have a bigger buffer, and so that protects you against uh, a short-term disruption. It doesn't always help with the longer-term disruption, and for so a more strategic approach would be to um, identify how you, the number of suppliers that you're sourcing from. So uh, my research has shown that the majority of um, organizations tend to single source, right? So economies of scale will drive down cost. And I've seen uh, uh, throughout, you know, industries, companies have been pushing for cost reductions and that has driven a reduction in the number of suppliers. And so we see a predominant focus on single sourcing as a result. Now, this places a lot of risk because if anything happens to that one supplier, you're out of luck. So 
you know, you can diversify the supply chain, invest in multiple suppliers, um, or you can come up with hybrid approaches. So Toyota had a very unique approach after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. And so the Toyota production system, they focus on having uh, very tight connections with their suppliers and with a single supplier. And so in order to diversify the supply chain, they didn't, they didn't increase the number of suppliers. They asked their suppliers to diversify the location where they're manufacturing the material, right? So there's not as much risk if one facility goes offline. So they're, they're spreading, they're putting the focus on their suppliers or the risk, uh, uh, putting the diversification on their suppliers to move the manufacturing to different locations um, such that that'll decrease the risk of any one location going offline having the severe impact that Toyota felt after the 2011 earthquake. Thank you. And I, I think this next question is actually tangential to that one. Um, there's been a lot of focus on just-in-time operations being a cause for some of the supply chain disruptions we were experiencing. Why is this and what is the alternative? So just-in-time, uh, we teach it in operations management. It has reduced the costs of operations, um, but it, all, it also has increased the risk of disruption. We're experiencing that now. So the alternative to just-in-time is what's been referred to as just-in-case, right? Mm -hmm. So investing in inventory, investing in uh, spare capacity. Um, and this is something uh, I'll refer to a local company so 3M has done this with their uh, N95 masks. So what they have done is they wanted to make sure that they had available production in, for the local markets that they serve. So they, they produce these markets not only in China, but also in the US and across the globe. So that the fact that they had location globally meant that they could uh, provide material from that uh, specific plant in a given country to that market, right? So this costs money, right? It's not cheap, uh, but they also invest in spare capacity, right? So spare capacity is incredibly expensive. It takes up space. It costs a lot of money for the tooling, um, but it also allowed them to respond a lot faster than they would have been able to otherwise. So you know, the, this just in case, it costs money, but it prepares you. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that the companies that are better prepared for this disruption, they're going to weather it much better than those that aren't. Thank you. And I think we have time for one or two more. So let me, um, let me ask you the next one. Um, how can you influence senior leaders that you, at some point, you can't continue to drive hard costs down with a specific widget. Soft cost savings such as lean initiatives, increased inventory turns on an item, et cetera, start to surface as hard cost plateau. I don't think that it's going to be the fact that we need to convince leadership. This needs to be a top-down approach. Leadership needs to identify that there is value to mitigating risk. Right. And it's it's hard. It's really challenging. How do you reward someone from preventing something that never happened? Right. So there are challenges with with that. It's not like a cost reduction where you see the return right away. There needs to be what I'm referring to as a long term, more sustainable approach. And the only thing that's going to drive this is for leadership to identify that there is value to uh, risk mitigation and to incentivizing the, you know, the organization to take that into account. Right? So you know, start having discussions with the leadership right, about how the current circumstances could have been different if we had done something different. And if, you know, it's those discussions that are going to hopefully open the eyes of the value of these risk mitigation me measures. 
Great. Thank you. Um, I think we are at time, and we always try to get folks out about five minutes early so they can get another cup of coffee before their nine o'clock meeting. But I want to thank you, Kyle, for a great presentation. Appreciate your time this morning. And to our participants, as always, we'll be sending out a link to the presentation in the next few days. We hope you enjoyed today's session. And our next online learning session is Thursday, May 28th, and it's titled The Benefits of Contemplative Mindfulness Practice. And we hope to see you then. Uh, have a great Memorial Day, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks for joining us at the University of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm.